And we're going to start off with um, Ellen Hamaker from the Netherlands. She flew over here just for this morning's talking. She'll be here tomorrow, too. And uh, then after her, I come in, jump in, and do the rest of the day this afternoon. Tomorrow morning, Tia Marasparo comes in, and he's our star programmer and senior statistician. So he's going to give some statistics background for uh, this new development of M+. Uh, he's also going to give some live demonstrations uh, after the coffee break. Morten Schultzberg is a newcomer who was here yesterday. He's going to jump in for part seven. And I'm going to end up with part eight and perhaps some leftovers that others want to uh, talk about. So without getting into the details of this, <clears throat> I want to say that we're very happy that Ellen Hamaker has joined the team that developed version 8. Ellen is a professor uh, at the Department of Methodology and Statistics at the Utrecht University in the Netherlands. And she uh, pretty much grew up with these kinds of uh, longitudinal data analysis, time series analysis, or dynamic structural equation modeling. Uh, she got her PhD in psychology, right? Uh, with the mentor of Peter Molinar, who has contributed to this field quite a lot, uh, written in Psychometrica. And Ellen herself has written a long list of very nice papers, which are both technically deep and uh, substantively uh, interesting and very accessible. And you will find that several of us speakers will refer back to her literature. So for the last, what, two years, Ellen has been kind enough to uh, help us in, on the M-plus team, the programmers and us, to uh, make relevant uh, analysis possibilities available in version 8. Relevant to these new kinds of uh, analysis of long longitudinal data. And we're very thankful. And we hope you continue to work with us. So um, with that, I think we'll let the day just play itself out, and uh, I think you're going to have a lot of fun learning new things. So with that, I'll hand it over to Ellen. So um, thank you for all being here. It's very exciting for me to have so many people interested in this kind of work because when I started out doing this kind of work, there were many conferences that I spoke. There were like 10 people in the audience and that included the other speakers of the session. So, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and some supporters, so. <laughs> um, so before like diving really into the dynamic structural equation modeling, um, I want to set the stage. So first explain a little bit more about what is intensive longitudinal data and what is dynamic modeling. So I know some of you will be very familiar with this and some of you will be less familiar with this. So that's why I want to make sure we're all on the same page. And I think what's really helpful here is to look at Cattell's data box. So Raymond Cattell came up with this idea um, in, in the uh, 50s or 60s and he proposed or he uh, suggested that we can uh, sample data from different dimensions. So you have the dimension of persons, you have the dimension of variables, but you also have the dimension of occasions. So at the time, a lot of people were doing only cross-sectional research, which means you sample, you look at only one occasion and you sample people and one or multiple variables. So that's a cross-section, it's a slice like that from this data box. And people were doing factor analysis on these and then saying things about personality. And he was interested in whether the factor structure that you get from this cross-section is actually the same as the factor structure you get when you look at a slice like this. A slice like this is you just select one person from the person dimension, you have multiple variables, and then multiple occasions. And multiple occasions here is not three or four, but it's intense, it's like 50 or 100. And they were doing this and then um, uh, doing a factor analysis on this kind of data and looking at whether the factor structure was similar to what you would get from cross-sectional research. And it doesn't have to be. You can show that the two are uh, statistically independent. 
One way to refer to this kind of data, where you have this many time points, is time series data. So that's a, a term that's also used a lot. So it's for a single subject, or n equals 1, and a large t. Now this kind of research, uh, so it was initiated by Cattell, but other people have been working on this as well. So one um, version of the analysis that has been used in psychology is what's now referred to as Cattell's P-technique. So it's the factor analysis of the data of a single person. Um, Peter Molinar, my supervisor, uh, he developed dynamic factor analysis. So then you look at lagged relationships. And lagged relationships are relationships between variables at different time points. So it can be the same variable or different variables. So that will be an important term over the next couple of days, lagged relationships. Um, others have contributed to this as well, people like Jack McArdle and uh, Michael Brown, for instance. So dynamic factor analysis. Uh, another interesting idea that was suggested is the measurement burst design. It was an idea that John Nesselrode proposed, where you have this intensive uh, measurement collection. So it's, it's the measurement burst. And then you repeat it later. Like, so you, you measure people maybe 100 times a person. And then half a year later, you do the same thing. And then you can see whether the structure changed or not. So this allows you to look at two things, like within person uh, variability, but also within person change. It was a really interesting idea at the time, like in 1991 or 94, I don't remember exactly. But it was more of science fiction. You know, it's like, it's just a thought experiment. Um, but now it's happening, so. And of course, you have intervention research, like ABAB designs, where they give people uh, um, uh, medication and a placebo, and they switch back and forth. This is quite a different kind of design than uh, in comparison to the other ones, although you can have many repeated measurements there as well. So I wanted to mention this. And it will be interesting to see in the near future to what extent we can also extend these new um, um, uh, data gathering techniques with experimental manipulation within a person so to actually be able to study causality. I will say a bit more about this later on. Now the critique that this kind of research which has also been referred to as ideographic so as opposed to nomothetic which is you know the cross-sectional thing or the big sample kind of research. So ideographic research or n equals one research, the critique that it has get, uh, gotten is that, well, these within-person fluctuations over time are just noise. It's just measurement error. Well, if that was the case, we wouldn't be able to find any structure in it. We wouldn't find a factor structure. You know, all the measurement errors would be just measurement error, would be uncorrelated. But we see structure both within occasions and across occasions. So that means that there's something going on. Another issue or another point of critique is uh, that it would not be generalizable to the population. And this is a good point, of course, but it's a two-way street. If you cannot generalize from the individual to the population, you can also not generalize from the population to the individual. So it's something to really worry about if that's what you believe, and I actually believe it's true, that there is this problem of uh, generalization between these levels. It's actually a reason to study both parts, you know, rather than to say, well, we don't want to study this. And another point of critique was, well, no one has this kind of data. And when I was doing my PhD, this was really true. It was very hard to get any data. Um, so at, yeah, at some point, I even used cow data, like milk of cows and the amount of hormones in it. And I'm not interested in cows. I love cheese, you know, being from the <laughs> Netherlands, but. So it was, and it was really, I felt like, yeah, I'm doing all this interesting stuff, having all these solutions for problems that don't exist, really, in psychology. But that has changed, because we have all this new technology. So we have the smartphones, smart watches, activity trackers, smart glasses. Um, this thing over here that I heard about last year, it's something you wear around your ankle, and it measures the amount of alcohol in your body. So instead of having to rely on self-report, so that's helpful. Um, there's also smart jackets that 
that uh, are being used that measure heart rate and uh, respiratory rate and that kind of stuff. So there's a lot of things happening here and it allows for a lot of new kinds of data. And this is the data that we refer to as intensive longitudinal data. So the different forms, typical different forms of this are, first of all, well, we have daily diary data. So it's self-report at the end of the day. And this was something that people were using, uh, that Cattell was also using, but it meant at the time you had to give a big pile of papers of a questionnaire and then you were to sort of rely on the person filling it out each evening, you know. And then they sometimes would give uh, stamped envelopes so that people would send it back to you. Um, I actually started in clinical psychology before I made the switch to methods and statistics. And um, I had to call people every evening to ask questions about ADHD behavior in their children. It was like, it was not for me, yeah. Um, just give me a formula, you know. But um, so that was daily diary data. It's once a day, basically asking, typically asking about the entire day, like how was your day, how were you feeling, or like how many drinks did you have, or whatever. Um, experience sampling method is a little different. This is actually typically multiple times a day at random time points. So we use smartphones for this, or they had also Palm Pilots, you know, before. They were like wacky old things. Um, so, and they, they would, um, so they prompt at random times during the day, and then ask people questions about where they are, how they're feeling, what they're doing, whatever the, the focus of the research. And it's about that moment. It's like, how are you feeling right now? Or like, what are you doing right now? Or just before the beep went off. Uh, a slightly different kind of data is ecological momentary assessments, although the, the terms are often used uh, ex in exchange. It's more healthcare related self report, whereas this is more uh, subjective experience. Another term is ambulatory assessments. Originally, this was more physiological measurements, so heart rate or activity trackers, but some are using this term in a more general way, like the the umbrella term for all kinds of intensive longitudinal data. There's also event-based measures, so you ask people to answer questions when something specific happens. So when they had a panic attack or when they started to smoke a cigarette. You ask like, what were you doing? Who were you with? And so on. And of course, there's also observational measurements. So you can have video recordings and score each frame or each five seconds and get intensive longitudinal data based on this. So that would be based on expert raters. If you want to know more about the methodology, you don't have to talk to me. <laughs> you can uh, look, um, there's a wonderful seminar by Tamlin Connor and Joshua Smith on YouTube. So here's the link for that one. And they tell you about all different kinds of uh, techniques that you can use. It might be a little bit outdated, but I think Tamlin Connor also has it on her website and tries to uh, keep it updated. She, but she says, you know, you can do a, a study like this for only $800, up to like 2000 depending on what kind of system you're using and where the data is stored. Um, there's a very nice website also from the Society for Ambulatory Assessment. And they also have conferences every year or every two years. And um, they also keep track of the publications in this area. So they have a, a big library or, of references for that. There is a, an interesting website by a company called Live Data. Um, so they actually create software for this kind of research. But they also have a lot of inf uh, information and like infographics about this kind of research. And there's also a group called Quantified Self. Are there any people here familiar with Quantified Self? Or are they, oh yeah, yeah, there's a few of them. So, and you do this yourself also? You quantify yourself? No? <laughs> you, you got bored? Yeah, I got sick of taking my own survey. Oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> this might be a bit of a problem, yeah, yeah. But, um, yeah, so it's a, it's a group of people like globally and they, they get together at certain places and they also have a, had a conference last summer in, in um, Amsterdam. Um, 
So it's, yeah, it's an interesting group of people that measure themselves and, and then talk about it, I guess. I don't know what they do exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So it would be interesting to see um, you know, what you can do with, with DSEM, with your data. You still have the data, I assume. Yeah, yeah, yeah. good. <laughs> All right. So some characteristics of this kind of data. Um, so you can have one person or multiple persons, but um, you will have one or more measurements per day. So one measurement if you have daily diary data, multiple measurements for the other ones. Typically then, yeah, you have multiple days and uh, sometimes also multiple waves. So that's Nestle Rhodes measurement burst design where you have an intensive period and then you wait a while and then you do it again. So some of the advantages that have been discussed in the literature, uh, when you think of the self-report measures, uh, there's no recall bias. So instead of asking people like, how are you, how have you been in the last two weeks or the last six months? You ask them, how are you right now? So they don't have to recall this, they can just tell you. So that's a big advantage over other forms of self-report. Uh, also the ecological validity is said to be very high. So when you have people do something in the lab, you don't know how this translates to how they behave in real life. Uh, you hope there is some connection there, but it's not necessarily guaranteed. So, th so that's a nice feature of this kind of data. You just measure me people as they are going about their daily life. So you really measure them in their normal habitat. Another thing is that if you're interested in physiological measurements, you can span a much larger time span. So when you do it in the lab, you can have people there for half an hour or two hours, maybe one night you know, in sleep research, but that's it. But if you can make them wear an activity tracker or even a smart jacket, you can measure them for days or weeks or even, maybe even months. So that's, that's a nice thing too. You can actually tap into a different kind of process than what you are um, looking at in the lab, a process that you know, takes place at a different time scale. Um, another nice thing is that you can look at uh, symptoms and behavior and monitor them. And this has given new possibilities for um, uh, feedback and intervention. So for instance, you can track a person over time and there can be a signal to the, um, the person, the, like a, a therapist, that maybe things are getting out of hand with the, the, the patient or the client, and then they can intervene. So instead of waiting until something really gets bad, you might be able to intervene in time, in real time. So that's referred to as e-health and m-health. And then the thing that I'm personally really excited about is that it provides a window into the dynamics of a process. When you think about what is a process, it's something that varies over time. And it's how different factors influence each other over time. And by having these many repeated measurements, we can actually have a look at this. So that's you know, what we will be talking about for the next two days. So um, this is a, a, a graph from a recent paper of me and Marike Wiggers. Where we try to say, well, there's, where we try to argue, there's really a paradigm shift happening here. So we are seeing that the number of papers that are based on this kind of data are really increasing exponentially. And I tried to update it for 2016, uh, you know, in preparation for the uh, presentation here, but I ran out of time. So, <laughs> but um, I, I saw that uh, at least for Psych Info, the the publication was like up here, so it's like still seeming to accelerate. And that brings me to the outline of today's talk. So, um, before we can go into the dynamic structural equation modeling, we need two ingredients. We need to know a little bit about what time series analysis is, and then the multi-level extension of this. So I have a few slides on this to um, 
uh, get you prepared. So time series analysis is a technique, or a class of techniques actually, that is used a lot in econometrics and um, other uh, disciplines. And um, its main characteristics is that the data is for a single case. And so when we say n equals 1, in psychology we think about this as a person, but in econometrics this could be like the, the currency or the, the exchange rate between the dollar and the euro. Or the uh, unemployment numbers. So we have a single case and we have a large number of time points. And so uh, some rule of thumb says more than 50, but uh, of course it can be a little bit less, but sometimes it's a lot more. So. And Time series analysis then is concerned with modeling the trends, cycles, and the autocorrelation structure. So trends, uh, it could be an increase or a decrease over time. Cycles, there could be like a week or an annual cycle or a month cycle in the data. And the autocorrelation structure is something that I will say more about in the next few slides. So it has to do with serial dependencies in the data. Now the goal of time, of time series analysis in general, I would say, is forecasting. So it's when you think of the weather, we want to know, we want to predict what the weather will be like tomorrow. So forecasting is a form of prediction, but not all forms of prediction are forecasting. It's really about, we have all this data up to this point, what is going to be the next few cases? So that's different than predicting based on intelligence how someone will do in a job. It's not forecasting. So what about this um, autocorrelation structure? So that's uh, something that the time series analysis focuses on a lot, on this autocorrelation structure. So then we have to understand what a lag is. So here I have a data um, set with capital T measurements, just one variable, and we put this in long format, so it's like this. So it's the same variable measured in the same person, for instance, uh, on capital T time points. So it could be my mood me measured at a daily basis. Now what we do when we make a lagged variable is we take the same, whoop, we take the same variable and shift it down one position. So here we have y2 with y1, y3 with y2, and so on. So if this is my daily mood, then this is my mood yesterday, this variable here. So at leg one, it's yesterday's mood. You see this is true uh, for day eight, it's day seven. For a day capital T, it's capital T minus one. And we can do this twice, or even more times. And then the autocorrelation is the correlation between the variable and itself at a different lag. So if we look at the correlation, and we could actually do this in SPSS, you can make a lagged variable, there is a function to do this, um, which you can also let's copy paste, of course. <laughs> That's how I used to do it. <laughs> um, and then just compute the correlation between those two variables, and you get the correlation at lag one. And it can be, it could be very high, close to one, it can be close to zero, or it can even be negative. And then you can do the same uh, with the y at leg two. You can have the correlation between this variable and this one, which means you get a correlation between today's mood and the day before yesterday. That's at leg two. Now here is an example of different kinds of processes. So here we have a, the first one is a white noise process measured at 1,000 occasions. And white noise means there is no autocorrelation at all. So the autocorrelation at leg one and two and so on is all zero. And that's what you see over here in the autocorrelation function. So we see the autocorrelation on the y-axis and the lag on the x-axis. And you see the autocorrelation at leg zero is equal to one, because it's the same variable, so then it's one. 
And at all other legs, it's basically zero. In the last column, we see the partial autocorrelation function. And this is the autocorrelation between y and y at leg two, corrected for leg one. Or y and y at leg three, corrected for leg one and two. So it's what those uh, observations still have in common after correcting for the observations that fell in between the two. So the combination of the autocorrelation function and the partial autocorrelation function used to be the tools that people used in time series analysis to determine what kind of process generated the data. And this really was a like, skill that you had to learn, or I would say a craft almost. So they would look at those plots and then decide, oh, that must be white noise, or they looked at those and then decided that must be an AR1 process, or a moving average, or whatever process. So this one is an AR1, and you see when you compare the sequence, you might be able to see that this one is more random than this one. There is a little bit more structure in this one. So when it goes up, it tends to stay up for a while, and when it goes down, it tends to stay down for a while. And that's what you see also when you look at the autocorrelations here. You see that after leg zero, there is still autocorrelation. So at leg one, there is an autocorrelation of, I don't know, like 0.7 or something. Yeah? And then it, it, it decays exponentially, which is a, a pattern of an AR1. Here we have an AR2. So in this model, when we predict mood, we can use yesterday's mood, but also the day before yesterday. That's still helping to predict today's mood. So that's an AR2. And we see there is um, a different pattern than this one. If we look at the autocorrelations, we see that there is this um, uh, sort of cycle going on. So it goes down, and then it becomes negative, and then it comes back up. So this is a possibility with AR2 processes, although there might also be AR2 processes that don't behave like this. So, and then there's a lot of other processes possible. So like there is libraries filled with um, literature on time series analysis. So this was really just covering the, the very, very basics of this. So now we move on to multi-level time series analysis. So what do we do? if we have more than one person. So for a long time, um, during my uh, PhD, I've, I just focused on single subject data. And then maybe doing the analysis separately for different people. So it's like replicated time series analysis. But another way to approach data from multiple individuals is by extending the time series model to a multi-level model. So if we have data, time series data, so intensive longitudinal data of multiple subjects, then we might be interested in um, quantitative differences between those people rather than qualitative differences. So if I do a separate analysis for each person, I might end up with a completely different model for each person. If that's what I'm interested in, that's fine. If I think that maybe the underlying process is more or less the same, but they differ in the parameters of the process, then the multi-level approach is a really good idea. So that's what we will be talking about mostly, or maybe, yeah, mostly. I think we are doing some N equals one stuff. Um, so the, what we can do is as we can look at individual differences in lag relationships between the variable and itself. So that's differences in the autoregression so regression between a variable and itself is referred to as autoregression. But also individual differences in lag relationships between different variables. And that's what we refer to as the cross-lagged relationships. It's crossed from one variable to another and lagged because it's at different time points. So it's maybe how my stress yesterday affects my happiness today. Now, you can build a multi-level model for this, and then you could refer to this as multi-level time series analysis, or you could say, well, it's actually dynamic multi-level modeling. It's just depending on what perspective you take, okay, or what point of departure. And 
I use the term dynamic multi-level modeling a lot because well, the word dynamic is good, you know. <laughs> so, um, and also that, you know, at least in psychology, people are more familiar with multi-level modeling than with time series analysis. So that seemed like a good way to enter it. And other people might come up with different names. So that's... So people have been doing this for a while. So how are they doing it before and plus existed? Um, one way they have been doing it was by using standard multi-level regression software. And how do you do this? Well, you set your data up in long format. And this is also what we need when we are going to do it with M+. So it's actually helpful to look at this. And here we have one variable, ID. So that's the person variable. So we have multiple observations for person one, then for person two and person capital N. And then we have some variable called Y subscript I T. So I stands for person and T stands for measurement occasion or time point. So we have Y one, 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 two, one, three, and so on to one capital T for person one. And then we start for person two, first observation, second, third, up to capital T. And actually, you know, the capital T could be different for different people. And so on up to the last person. So this would be your data in long format. And then what you could do is just create the lagged predictor by using SPSS or R or whatever program you are using. So make a lagged version of this variable. So we have today's score with yesterday's score for person one, but also for person two and so on. Of course, then you have to make sure that you make this one missing here because otherwise you would be regressing person's two score at the first occasion on the last score of the first person. So you would have to do something you know, when you switch from one person to another. So now you can use this as a predictor in your multi-level model. And you can also do this for another variable. So uh, this could be my happiness today, happiness, yester happiness yesterday, but also stress yesterday can have these as predictors. So this would be for the autoregression, and this one would be for the cross legged regression. Now let's look at an example of the autoregressive uh, relationship. So here we have negative effect of individual I at occasion T, which is regressed on negative effect of individual I at occasion T minus one. As you can see, the regression coefficient here, which I refer to as phi, subscript I, is allowed to vary across individuals. That's why it has a subscript i. So the slope can be different. So that's where we have the quantitative differences in the process between people. The intercept is also allowed to differ. And then there is a residual term here, which is referred to as the innovation or the random shock, residual disturbance, perturbation, innovation. There's many terms for this. So it's basically everything that affects today's negative effect that's unrelated to yesterday's negative effect. So it could be how well I slept or what I had for breakfast, how easy it was to get here this morning, whether Bank was encouraging or not. Yeah. <laughs> you never know, yeah, it's like, it's, it's random. <laughs> So that's what's happening at level one. So uh, yeah, for people familiar with multi-level modeling, this will be easy. For you who are not familiar with multi-level modeling, this might be a little challenging or new, but it's level one is the lower level, which here is the repeated measures. And then level two are the persons. So the date are nested. We have repeated measures nested in persons. So level two, we allow for individual differences in the intercept and individual differences in the autoregression, so the, the slope, the phi parameter. So this uh, is the autoregression or the slope in the regression equation. Now this kind of research was, to my knowledge, first initiated by Sols, Green and Hillis in a paper in 98, and then basically no one ever did anything with it again until Peter Kuppens from Leuven started to uh, work on this again. 
And they focus, the, the focus in this kind of research is on the autoregressive parameter phi, so, which is sometimes referred to as inertia, because the closer it is to one, the more you know, yesterday's uh, score spills over or carries over into today. So if there was something that made you, your negative effect peak yesterday, if you have a phi parameter close to one, then it will still be affecting your mood today and tomorrow and so on for quite a few days. If you are a person with a phi parameter close to zero, what happened yesterday doesn't matter. You know, like every day is a new day. So, so that's the, the idea of this term inertia. So it's about how quickly do you return to your baseline after being perturbed? Or um, how much carryover is there from one occasion to the next? You can also think of this as regulatory weakness. The idea is if we get stuck in a certain state, that's not a healthy kind of behavior. So that's why that, what, what the term regulatory weakness comes from. So if it's close to zero, that would be better than having one that's close to one. Um, the work by Peter Kuppens and others has shown that it's positively, this autoregressive parameter, so the phi parameter, is positively related to current depression. So people who are depressed tend to have a higher autoregressive parameter. Also neuroticism, again positive. So people who are higher on uh, neuroticism tend to have a higher autoregressive parameter. And also being female. So it's, it's like the, the big three. <laughs> and then um, they also have studies where it's been shown that it's predictive of later depression, even after controlling for current depression. So it's like later depression two or two and a half years later. So it's an interesting finding because this seems to suggest that the way you regulate your moment-to-moment -moment effect is actually something, if, if we know about the dynamics of this, this helps us to predict whether you are at risk of becoming depressed later on. So this immediately feels like going to causal conclusions, which of course we have to be careful with. But it's an interesting finding. Um, if we focus on the cross legs part, that's when we have multiple variables and we look at the way that one variable predicts another one at another occasion. And one area in which this has been done is in what is referred to as dynamic networks. And they are basically were, um, based on a multi-level vector autoregressive one model. Or you could think of it as a multi-level extension of a cross-leg panel model. But you have multiple variables that predict themselves and each other over time. And that's what we see here. We have y1 to yk, so different variables, certain like, symptoms that are associated with depression. And they are predicted from themselves. So here we see the autoregression for a variable one, but also all the other uh, variables at the previous occasion. And then we have y2, which is also predicted from y1, but also all the other uh, lagged uh, variables, up to k. Called vector, because it's multivariate, so that's what the v stands for autoregressive because you regress on the vector itself, order one because it's only leg one that we are looking at. It's only the current score compared to the previous score, but not the one before that. That would be leg two. Now this um, idea of having this as a multi-level model uh, was uh, discussed in a paper by Laura Bringman in 2013 and is now further being popularized by the software of Sasha Epscom, for instance. Um, and um, the focus is really on the cross-leg parameters, so, uh, and, and they talk about uh, the variables as uh, nodes, because they have this link with network analysis, so then you talk about it as nodes, and the strength between the connections of the nodes, or the, yeah. And the idea is that psychopathology should not be, so that's in this area specifically, psychopathology should not be thought of as a latent variable causing all these symptoms, but instead we should think about psychopathology as symptoms that trigger each other. 
So for instance, if you uh, think of depression, you don't sleep very well, therefore you cannot concentrate very well, therefore you make mistakes, therefore you get a lot of negative feedback from your boss, it stresses you out, you don't sleep well, and so on. So it's like these uh, symptoms that trigger each other, rather than there is this one latent variable causing everything. So that's the, the case they're making. Um, and part of what they do is using time series data or intensive longitudinal data, using those dynamic networks. So the idea then is that if you have stronger connections, so if those cross-legged parameters are larger, then if one symptom gets triggered, it spreads more easily to the other symptoms. Whereas if all the cross-legged parameters would be close to zero, then you might not sleep very well, but it's not going to make any changes in all the other symptoms. So psychopathology would be having stronger connections between the symptoms. All right, a fundamental problem. If we look at cross-sectional data, for instance, the relationship between the number of words that a person types and the percentage of typos, we might find this negative relationship. So we just have like 100 people and we let them type for five minutes. And then we see how many words did they type per minute and what's the percentage of typos they made. We might find this relationship. Now we would not try to generalize this to the individual level. We wouldn't say, okay, this means if I just type faster, I'm gonna make fewer mistakes. Because we know at the within person level, there's probably a positive relationship. So within person, we have this relationship. If I type faster, I'm gonna make more mistakes. If I type slower, I'm gonna make fewer mistakes. And in this case, this relationship is exactly the same for all the individuals. No individual differences in this relationship. So how did we get this negative relationship in the cross-sectional data? Well, the people differ with respect to their means. So the, they're stable between person differences here. And here we see them as the blue dots. And so at the between person level, there's actually a strong negative relationship. And what is this reflecting? Well, maybe it's reflecting something like experience. So here we have a person with very little experience, person, uh, oh, sorry, with a, uh, a lot of experience, I should say. So the person can type a lot and make very few mistakes. And over here we have a person that types very slow and makes a lot of mistakes. So when we think of cross-sectional data, what is happening is we have a, a picture like this, and from each of these ellipses, we just take one point. But that's cross-sectional data. We cannot tell to what extent this point represents the person's mean, and to what extent it represents a temporary deviation from the mean. So if we have cross-sectional data, we cannot separate the within-person relationship from the between-person relationship. We get something that's a blend of the two, and there's no way to tell. Of course, in this scenario, we, we might have a third variable, which is experience, and then we would be able to tell the difference. But in general, the point is that there might be many causes or uh, factors related to this between-person uh, relationship that we don't know. But if we have uh, multi-level data or intensive longitudinal data, so we have repeated measures of the same people, of multiple people, then we can actually separate those two parts and find out what the between per or sorry the within person relationship is and the between person relationship. So this is just showing the same thing in a different way. So cross sectionally, we might have a correlation of minus 0.4, but this might be because within and between it's also minus 0.4, but it could also be that within there is minus 0.8, whereas between there is zero. And what is adding to the confusion probably is that some people refer to cross-sectional as between person, because of course it's between persons, but we have to realize that part of it is stable between person, 
And that's the part that we would really refer to as between in the multi-level part. And part of it is temporary, and that's the within part, actually. You can also think of it like the trade part and the state part. Um, yeah. So what we can also look at is those within-person slopes. So in the typing example that I gave, the within-person relationship was the same for each person. But it's also possible that we have different relationships. So here we have negative affect and how it's related to negative events. And so we might see that for this person, there is a little bit of a relationship. For this person, there is quite a strong relationship. And for this person, there's basically no relationship. So whether something negative happens or not does not really change this person's negative effect. Whereas here, there is a lot of uh, change. And you can also do this for lagged relationships. So we can have current negative effect regressed on preceding negative effect. So it's the autoregressive relationship. So maybe one person here does not have a very strong relationship between yesterday's negative effect and today's negative effect. So it's like one of those persons that every day is a new day. Whereas here, there is a strong relationship. So there's a lot of carryover from one day to the next. So that's basically what these three bullets are saying also. Um, so, um, one thing that, especially people who are familiar with time, uh, sorry, with multi, the multi-level literature, will be thinking about is also about centering the predictor. So, if we want to separate within and between in the right way, uh, it's known from the multi-level literature that it's important to center the the within person predictor per person. So you have to subtract the mean of the individual from the predictor. And um, together with Raoul Grasman, uh, I published a paper in which we looked at how this works out when we are looking at a lagged predictor. So it's the same variable, so the autoregressive model. And we did a simulation study in which we compared not lagging, or sorry, not centering the lagged predictor so just leaving it as it is. So that would be, based on our knowledge from the multi-level literature, that would be wrong. It should lead to bias because it will mix the within and the between person relationship. And then we used the sample mean, but also uh, a mean estimated from an empty model. So we just started with an empty model, estimate the person's mean based on this, and then use that for centering the lag predictor and then run the, the, the multi-level AR model. And because we were doing a simulation, we also had the true mean. So then we thought, well, we can also use the true mean for sampling because, you know, we're in control here. So let's see what happens. And this is what happens. So here, the, the phi parameter, so the autoregressive parameter, had a mean of 0.3. And there was some uh, uh, randomness to that as well. So it had a normal distribution. We varied the number of people from 20 to 100 and also the time points number of time points per person from 20 to 100. And here we see the bias, and we see if you don't use any centering, which should be mixing the within and the between person relationship, and note the between person relationship is one, because it's the same variable. Yeah? So the between person regression is one. But you see there's hardly any bias. Then if we, then if we used the sample mean, so that's what people would typically do, and that's what people have been doing. You see that there is bias, negative bias. You see that the bias decreases as the number of time points increases, but you see that it does not really change as the number of subjects increase. So if you compare this one to this one to this one, you see there's not much change. Then if we look at the other two means that we used, so uh, an estimated mean based on the empty model, but even the true mean, it doesn't really reduce the bias very much. So I was really shocked when I saw this and I checked it many times and other people checked my code and even Tiomir looked at the code and were 
very sure that this is true. And then later, Theomir found out that this is actually very well known um, in econometrics literature known as Nichols bias. So, um, so in the paper, we sort of suggest that, well, maybe it's better not to center the lex predictor, although you want to center the lag predictor to get an intercept that is interpretable as the person's mean. So it's, so then you would have to run two models and re, like present results from different models, even though you're interested in only one model. So it's, it's, it was not a good thing to be reporting in a way. Um, so that's what happens when you use standard uh, multi-level regression software. If we try to do this kind of analysis, we are faced with the following problems and limitations. Well, first of all, we, uh, as I just said, you have this negative bias in the autoregressive parameter. So that's referred to as Nichols bias. Also, you can only have one outcome variable. Or, so if you have a multivariate model you want to run, you have to have separate um, models for this. And there are some ways to trick the program into having more than one outcome variable, but it's very complicated. So. So this, uh, the people that are doing uh, dynamic networks are typically doing separate regression models for each outcome variable. Also, you can only have observed variables in your, as your outcome, but also as the predictors. Whereas you might want to have a factor model to account for you know, a latent variable, or you want to account for measurement error in your model, or you want to have moving average terms, which is also a comp component in time series analysis that's being used a lot in other disciplines. Missing data are a problem, because if I have a missing score on my outcome, the lagged predictor will have a missing score at the next occasion. So if I have a lot of missings, then I will have very few cases where both the outcome and the predictor are observed. So that could really be a problem. And we have a lot of missing data, of course, if we ask people all the time. They, they get bored with filling things out, or they're busy, or, yeah. And another problem is unequally spaced data. The ESM data are, by definition, unequally spaced in time, because you want to catch people in the moment. You're not going to ask them, like, at 9 o'clock and 10 o'clock and 12 o'clock, but you ask them at random time points such that they cannot anticipate the next measurement moment. So they just are going about their no normal lives. So we have these unequally spaced observations. And one way to deal with this is by adding missing data in between to make the cases more equally spaced, even though not all observations or cases are then observed. But that wouldn't work if you try to use this approach, because if you lag the predictor, then yeah, you get this problem. If there's too much missingness, there's nothing left. The good news is that dynamic structural equation modeling in N plus tackles all these problems and more. So that's something to be really excited about. It's certainly something that I'm super excited about. Um, so now that we have laid down the funda foundations, we can actually start to work. So let's look at the first application here, which is a multi-level vector autoregressive one of order one model. And the da data I'm using here come from a study that was run at the MPI Institute in Berlin 10 years ago, and is referred to as the Cogito uh, study. And they were interested in aging. And so they had two samples. They had a younger sample of uh, individuals, I have to see, yeah, between age 20 and 31, and an older sample between ages 65 to 80. First sample had 101 individuals, second one 103. And they had about 100 daily measurements. And they actually, because they were interested not only in uh, self-report of affect, but also in cognitive functioning and learning and those kind of things, they had these people come to the laboratory on each occasion. So they had people come to the lab for 100 days. It's like so impressive. <laughs> it's like, yeah, I don't know. Um, so um, the people were there and then they were doing all these 
uh, cognitive tests and then also filling out uh, questionnaires about, for instance, their positive and negative effects. And that's the variables that I'm focusing on here. Now, what is fundamental to doing DSEM in M plus is a decomposition into different parts. And here I will only focus on two parts, and later on a third part will be added, but for now we're just two parts. And so we have positive effect and negative effect of individual I at occasion T, and it's decomposed into two parts, a between part, which we call mu subscript PAI. So it's the mean of positive effect for individual I does not have a subscript T because it's the mean of the person over time. So it does not vary over time anymore. And we also have a mean for negative effect. And then we have this second part here with the uh, superscript uh, W to indicate it's the within person part. So it's the individual deviation, temporal deviation at occasion T from the own person's mean. So we can think of this as the trait score of a person over time. Mm -hmm. And then the other part is the state part. It's like at this occasion, you, you deviate from it a little, and then you know this varies over time. So the mu's are the individual means, sometimes referred to as the baseline. Although that sounds like that's something that's at the beginning only, but it's like the trait score also referred to as equilibrium, so it's the person's uh, preferred state to be in, in a way. So it's, the, it's the, for the between person part in the model. And then there's these temporal deviations within person, so it's the within person centered part. You can subtract the, the, the person's mean or the cluster mean from the score and then you get this part here. So here we see two um, hypothetical sequences of individuals, and we see that the first individual has a higher mean than the second one, and then the deviations from the individual's mean, that would be the within-person part. And we see that the within-person part has a different structure for the first person than for the second person. We see second person has more variability, but also a little bit more structure in it. It's, well, it's sort of, you know, if you're experienced. Yes. <laughs> If you created the data, I should say. <laughs> All right, this is another form of experience. Um, so then, one thing you can look at, of course, is uh, um, intra-class correlation. So it's how much variance is there between, at the between person level, in comparison to the total uh, variance, and the total variance is the sum of within and between. And so I do this here for positive effect in both samples and the negative effect in both samples. We see that the middle bar is higher than the last bar, so the between person variance is larger than the within person variance on average. And that's also what you see when you look at the intra-class correlations. They're all pretty high. So that's just a descriptive way of looking at your data. The model we're running is here. So this is one way to represent the model. We had many emails going back and forth, you know, when we were developing this on how to best represent these models. Try to do it in one picture, basically, um, which is doable when you have univariate models, but for a bivariate model, it uh, doesn't really work anymore. So this is a bit of a multiple, multi-dimensional picture. Um, so you will see the, the one-dimensional picture. One dimensional sounds bad, but um, the, the, the picture in which it's all in one picture, you can see it in the manual, but then there's other pictures uh, representing the more complex models. Here what we see is there is a, a decomposition, so that's what I showed, uh, the decomposition into the between person part and the within person part. And then I have a within person part here at the top and a between person part at the bottom. So let's focus at the within person part. That's where we have the vector autoregressive model. So I regress positive effect centered within person, so that's the W, and negative effect at occasion T on the two scores at the preceding occasion, so the preceding day. So we have the autoregressions here. 
And then we have the cross regressions crossing. Yeah. The black circles imply that these regression coefficients can be different across individuals. So these are random slopes. They have different values for different individuals, quantitative differences in the dynamics. And black circles become open circles at the between person level. So that's why we have the phi and n, it's the autoregressive parameter for negative effect. And it it's, has different values for different individuals. And we can correlate it, for instance, with the individual's mean on negative effect, which comes from the decomposition here. And the same is true for the other uh, lagged parameters. So we have the four random effects for the random slopes, and then two random effects, which are the two means from the decomposition. And all of them are allowed to be correlated here. And then here we have the innovations, which will have variances and a covariance, and that's at the within-person level. Doing the same thing, but now with formulas, we get the within-person model, positive and negative effect, both regressed on positive and negative effect at the preceding occasion, so t minus 1, plus a residual. The phi PP and phi NN are the autoregressive parameters, inertia or carryover or regulatory weakness. Phi PN and phi NP are the cross leg parameters, so phi PN is going to positive effect, coming from negative effect. Um, and it's referred to sometimes also as spillover, spilling over from one area into another. And then we have the zetas. These are the innovations or residuals, disturbances, etc. It's like everything that is not accounted for by including the previous measurement as a predictor. So the parameters that are being estimated at this level are the variances of the innovations, which I refer to as theta 1, 1 and theta 2, 2 here, and the covariance between the two. And one thing that's important to realize is that the zetas, they are not measurement error. So they're not just random measurement error. They are innovations, or they're sometimes referred to as dynamic error, because they affect, uh, this affects the current occasion, but then at the next occasion, the current occasion is over here. Right. So it's, it's when we, oops, not sure if it's, yeah, it doesn't help this picture. So um, it's like you, you, you have this process, it's affecting a certain occasion and then it's, the, the, this occasion is then the predictor of the next occasion, so the residual is also ending up there. So that's why it's referred to as dynamic error, whereas measurement error would only affect a single occasion and not subsequent occasions. So it's not measurement error, it's everything that affects the process we're studying and that is carried forward. So at the within-person level, we now have three parameters. The between-person level, we have those six random effects, the two means and then the four regression coefficients or slopes. We have their means, so these would be referred to as the fixed effects, denoted here with gammas and then individual deviations from these. So that's these six terms here, for which we are going to have a covariance matrix. So this means here we have six fixed effects, that's the gammas. Then we have six variances, it's the diagonal of the covariance matrix of those uh, U's. And then 15 covariances, plus the three parameters at the within-person level, and if I did it right, I think this is 30 parameters in total. I'm really bad at this, but um, yes, because we have 6 plus 6 plus 3 plus 15. So we started out with two variables. Now we have 16 parameters. Now that might give you an awkward feeling, like should we doing, be doing some sort of data reduction, right? Neelam Ram pointed out to me that another way of looking at this is saying, well, I started with a data box or a data matrix of dimensions 100 days, 100 people, two variables. And now I've reduced this to 30 parameters. You know, that sounds much better. Yeah? 
And it's important to realize that the, the cases are not independent here. It's not, I mean, the, the individuals are independent. So in that dimension, we have independent observations. But within a person, the observations are not independent. So there is more information there. And that's what we're trying to account for with those lax parameters and with separating within and between. So how do we do it in M plus? Well, we have the data in long formats. So similar to what I showed before, but we don't have to create the lagged predictors ourselves. That's something that M plus is going to do for us. So we just need the data in long format. So here, I would have a variable that's the ID, so the person. I should have a variable that indicates what measurement occasion it is. And then I have the two variables, positive effect and negative effect, and that's it. So just need a data set with those four variables. So each record is a case, or sorry, is a time point within a person, and so we have multiple records per person. And this is how we do it. So here I have the variable commands. Um, there's more variables, as you can see, in the data set. But um, over here I'm indicating I'm just going to use daily positive effect and daily negative effect, those two variables. There is a cluster variable ID, so that's to specify the different individuals. I indicate there's a missing value code, my, minus 999. Then I look, use this command here, lagged. And I tell M plus, I want to have lagged versions of those two variables, and please lag them by just one. Right? So that's what the one here stands for. So it's going to be yesterday's positive effect and yesterday's negative effect. And then I have the T interval variable. So that's the session date, as you can see. So this is, uh, the people came to the lab to do this. They didn't come on weekends. And sometimes they didn't come because they were ill or busy or on a vacation. So not all the observations are just one day apart. So we want to account for this when we do the analysis, because we know that lagged relationships depend on the interval between the observations. If I have observations that are closer together, the autoregression will be higher than when the observations are further apart. And for cross-legged relationships, it actually might play out differently. Like the effect might be stronger at larger legs than at shorter legs for some interval and then decreases again. So we want to take the interval into account. And I'm going to explain this very briefly here. Bengt will be explaining more about this. He's, I think he's practicing it now. Um, <laughs> Tio Mir will be explaining it tomorrow. So you will get different explanations of the same thing. And hopefully, you know, one of them will really click for you. Um, what, you wh what we have, this session date, is just telling how many dates, basically, since the beginning of the study is this. So suppose you start measuring on Monday, then you have like had one, two, three, four, five from Monday to Friday. Six and seven are missing, and then the next one gets score eight. You know, it's the eighth day since the beginning. What I'm telling M plus here is to use an interval of one for this variable. And with daily measurements, it's very easy to decide what interval to use. It's typically going to be one. For ESM, it's going to be more complex. So then you have to decide whether you want to have it in minutes or in hours or one and a half hours. But for daily measurements, it's easy. It's just one. And what it's doing is that M plus is looking like, OK, I see this variable, one, two, three, four, five, and then eight. So seven and six are missing. I'm going to just enter missing records in between. So that all the new records that you have are equally spaced in time. Not, uh, we're not creating new observations, but we're taking into account that the intervals differ. So we, make a, we choose a time grid here. The, the grid is one day. This is, is the, the size of one day. And it's aligning the measurements in this grid. All right. And then the analysis commands. Type is two-level random, so 
We're going to have a two-level model, so that's with the decomposition into within and between. Random, because I also want to have the random slopes, the random lag parameters. Estimator is base. DSEM is all in Bayesian uh, statistics, so um, you have to, there's no choice here. Not yet, anyways. <laughs> I'm using two processors because that makes it f go faster. Actually, because Bank told me to, but yeah. <laughs> Um, B iter is saying I want to have, uh, and then 5,000 here, is saying I want to have at least 5,000 iterations of Bayesian es uh, estimation. Then we'll explain more about Bayesian estimation, so I'm going to skip over that, but um, uh, this seemed a good number for this particular problem. And thin is 10, is meaning that I'm only going to save 1 in 10 iterations, but again, Bank will say more about that later. Are we getting close to those 15 minutes, actually? You can take another 15. Oh, good. Right. <laughs> He's so generous, isn't he? <laughs> so this is... <laughs> what, did you make a face? <laughs> oh, I'll watch it on the video. <laughs> it's being recorded, you know that. Um, so this is how we specify the model. So we have the model, we have a within part and a between part. So at the within part, we're going to specify the leg relationships. And as you might remember, there's four leg relationships, two autoregressive ones and two cross-legged ones. And that's what we specify here. So I specify regress uh, positive effect on positive effect at the previous day. So this uh, percent one implies it's the lagged variable. And we created the lagged variable in the variable statement here. So we had the lagged... I want to have it at leg one, and that's what I'm referring to here with the percent one. So day, a daily positive effect on daily positive effect yesterday, daily positive effect on daily negative effect yesterday, and then the same thing for negative effect. So we have the autoregression here, autoregression here, and then the two cross regressions in the middle. So I call it P uh, underscore PP, so that's the phi parameter for positive effect to positive effect. And this one is the phi parameter for positive effects coming from negative effects, so positive regressed on negative, negative regressed on positive, and negative on negative. You can give them other names if you like. You, know, you can call them John, Pete, and so on, <laughs> or whatever. Or S1 and S2 and S3, that's, I think, what Bengt prefers. Um, so these are names that we give to those random slopes, those black dots in the picture. So these become variables then at the between person level. So that's what we see here. Between person level, I have those variables. And of course, the two means, they come from the decomposition that's part of the DSEM approach when we do uh, uh, multi-level or two-level. It will always be there. So here I'm just saying I want everything to be correlated with everything. That's what I'm saying here. Um, the output, I asked for the tech one output. I'm a big fan of the tech one output. Asked for tech eight because Bank told me to. <laughs> and I asked for standardized results, as I will explain later why I'm doing this. There's also some plot options. I will say more about this later on. And this is what the results look like. So what we see over here is the results for the within person part. As you might recall, at the within person level, we only estimate the two innovation variances and the covariance between the two. I refer to them as theta 1, 1, theta 2, 2, and theta 2, 1 in the slides. So here we have the covariance between the innovations. So it's not between the variables, but only the residual parts of those variables. And then the residual variances. I don't think this is very interesting. Yeah. Then we go to the between person part, and I skipped the first part of this, so that's why we have the dot, dot, dot here. I will go, come back to this later. So that's uh, with all the with statements, all the covariances. But what I'm focusing on here first is the means. 
and the variances. So as you might recall, so we have six latent variables or random effects at level two that are all allowed to be correlated. They all have a mean, that's what I was referring to as the gammas, fixed effects. And that's actually this, what we see over here. These are the gammas, or the fixed effects. And we can see that all of them are different from zero. So we can see, uh, for the means maybe that's not such a big surprise, but we can see that all the lagged effects on average have a mean that differs from zero. So both the autoregressive ones and the cross-legged regressions. And we also see the variances. So these are the, the random effects, and all of them are also getting an asterisk to indicate that they differ from zero. What are we seeing here? Actually, we see the, the, the point estimate in the first column. So that's your parameter estimate. The posterior standard deviation, which is, I don't know if I can say this, but sort of like the Bayesian equivalent of a standard error. That's a like very slippery slope where I'm at here. <laughs> um, there's a one-tailed p-value um, that I don't really look at. There is this 95% uh, credible interval, because we're doing Bayesian analysis. Not confidence interval, credible interval. Um, so it has a lower bound and an upper bound, and you can use that to see whether zero is inside of it. And if zero is inside of it, then you would say, well, there's not really evidence that this parameter deviates from zero. If zero is not inside of it, then there is evidence that this parameter deviates from zero. For a variance, when you are doing Bayesian analysis, the credible intervals will never contain zero because a variance cannot become negative. So don't get too excited here, you know, that, oh, like, all my variance, like, all, everything is random. Well, that's, yeah. Okay. What is, so we, we have this, these fixed effects here. And of course, uh, one of the things that we might be interested in is looking at the cross legs parameters and comparing their relative size. So especially uh, so with negative affect and positive affect, we might be less excited about this, but when you are looking at males, like husbands and wives, you might be interested in like, who is the driving force here? Like, you know, who is, who is leading, who is lagging? <laughs> <laughs> um, so we, w we are interested in comparing these parameters, the cross-leg parameters, as we are also in when we just do cross-leg panel research. I want to know like which variable is causally dominant. I do it like this because of course we never know like unob unobserved variables, but, but that's the point of the research often. But to be able to compare those leg, cross leg parameters, we have to have standardized ones because otherwise it just depends on the scale of the variables. And even when the, you know, the variables are measured on the same scale, like the same Likert scale or whatever, it doesn't mean that the amount of variance is the same. And that's the thing that we should be looking at when we want to compare uh, the relative strength of relationships. And here, one other thing that you can think about is that um, if we have two people that have a parameter going from negative effect to positive effect of 0.3, but one person has a lot more variance in negative effect than the other one, it's not explaining the same amount of information or predicting the same amount of variance in the outcome variable. So that's another thing that we have to take into account. Standardization in multi-level models is a tricky issue. And that's why most programs do not include standardized results for multi-level models. Uh, together with um, my former student, Noemi Schuurman, we published a paper um, discussing four ways of standardizing in multi-level uh, models. So you can use the total variance, which is referred to as grand standardization. You can use the between-person variance, so that's the variance of the variables from the decomposition, just the between-person part, so the variance in the mu's. So that's between standardization. You can use the average within person variance and use that to standardize parameters or the within person variance per person. And in the paper, we argued that it's most meaningful to use the last version 
So to standardize per person and then take the average of the standardized parameters. As this is what parallels what you would do if you just had a time series analysis where you just have one case, you don't have any between person variance. You just have the variance of this one person and that's the variance that you use for standardizing your parameters. So that's what we argue in the paper and I was happy to be able to convince Teomir to implement this in M+. <laughs> and it's now available for all multi-level models. So that's quite a, that's quite an achievement, I think. <laughs> um, so then the standardized fixed effect is actually the average standardized within person effect. Ugh, terrible sentence. What you get when you ask for STDYX is this kind of output. So it says within level standardized estimates averaged over clusters. So clusters are the persons here. So it's standardized per person and then the average of this is taken. And you see that we get the autoregressive parameter here for positive effect. We get the cross one from negative to positive and from positive to negative. And then we can compare those two to see whether one of them is much larger than the other. And here we see it's not really that much of a difference. And they are very small anyways. So. But this is what we get. Um, we also get this uh, correlation here. So it's the correlation between the, um, I assume it's between the innovations and not between the variables. So you can always ask Teomir, you know, because he, he programmed it. So. He knows. <laughs> um, you also get the R square. So the, the within level R square averaged across all the clusters. So now you can see how much variance within a person is explained by the lagged relationships yeah. on average. But of course, this might be very different across individuals. So the part that I skipped before in the between person output is with the with statements, so the covariances. So as you might remember, I allowed all the six random effects to be correlated with each other. So now, um, and then you get a six by six covariance matrix for this. Um, covariances are not so interesting, so it's better to look at the correlations. Again, you can get them by using the standardized results. And instead of representing this as a six by six correlation matrix for the younger and the older sample, I'm using a program QGraph by Sasha Epskamp in, in R. You can enter a a matrix, for instance, a correlation matrix, and then plot this um, as a network. But I really want to stress here, it's, for me, it's just a convenient way of representing a correlation matrix. I don't want to interpret this as a network where nodes trigger each other. Um, it's, it's in a way more comparable to cross-sectional data. Um, but you see the means and then the four uh, legs parameters, and you see that these are, uh, this is the uh, network for the younger sample and for the older sample. You see that the relationships are quite different for the two. The blue relationships imply a negative correlations, the red ones imply positive, and then the, the thicker the line, the stronger the correlation is. So. so this is one way to look at these kind of data and think about, okay, so is, what does this mean that, you know, the way that these variables are related to each other um, are different? In, in younger and older people. I guess this would be a good place to have a break. So Bank will hand you a microphone, which is helpful also for the recordings that we're making. So if you have a question, please raise your hand and, yeah. So let me say, um, so we'll have this 15 minute question and answer session uh, in each, at the end of each part, like we said. And we want to remind people that uh, this workshop is being videotaped, so please behave. <laughs> and I should also say that uh, there are handouts on the AMPLUS website in full format, colors and all, if you want to download it that, and look at that instead of <clears throat> on the paper. And with that, let's see who has a good question for Ellen. Uh, thank you. Can you go back to that diagram you were just looking at and put into words how young people and old people differ? Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, well, what, what seems to be the case to me, but, you know, it's, 
I'm, I'm new to this as well. Okay. So, but um, what seems to be the case is that in, in the older people, we see that the mean of positive effect, the autoregressive parameter for positive effect, and the effect from negative to positive effect are all related to each other. So there's like a, a positive effect system here and a negative effect system. And here we see that everything is positively related. So people with a higher uh, mean level of negative effect tend to have more carryover in their negative effect, but also a stronger effect of positive effect on not negative effect. And here we see uh, instead that there are some uh, negative relationships. So people with a higher mean on positive effect tend to have less carryover, or sorry, yeah, carryover or autoregressive uh, effect for their positive effect. And yeah, for the for the younger sample, you see that it's like there's different correlations that show up. And to what extent this is really something that would replicate or not, that is still a completely open question. Yeah. Hi. Um, on slide 17, mm -hmm. you have uh, uh, equations for level one model. Yes. So the uh, on the right side of the equation, the third terms, you know, the blocks of third terms, they are subscripts K that's appearing for two, I guess, uh, two things. So can you explain the equation a little and oh, subscript so, K? So K is referring to which variable it is. Right. So we have variable one to K, and they are regressed. So each variable is regressed on variable one on variable 2, 3, and 4, etc. That's what the dots stand for. And then on variable k at the previous occasion. That's why all the predictors here have t minus 1. Yeah, and then so it's a phi 1, phi 2, phi k, and then there's another k repeated. The third. Um, Do you think this one? Do you mean this yeah, one? There's a yeah, k so this k. is a Yeah, this is k, k, because it's the autoregressive parameter. So going from k, uh, coming from k, going to k. Okay. So it's this one is. Uh, am I saying that? Yeah, it's. Oh, I might have switched these. Am I? Oh no. Yeah, sorry. This one is coming from k, going to one. So it's coming from k, going to one. Yeah. Okay. And this one is coming from k, going to k. So that's why it has k k, and then i to indicate it can differ across individuals. Yeah. Yeah, personally, I prefer like matrix notation here, but Bank wouldn't let me. So, <laughs> uh, could could we go to your uh, output slide thirty, or, or excuse me, the um, model commands? Yeah. So, two questions here. Um, on the li line with lagged, the one indicates uh, a, a one interval lag. Yes, so if this means it's yeah, just legged by one position. Right. If you wanted to look at, say, one and two levels, how, how do you extend that? Do I think it's just two, isn't it? Yeah. So then you automatically get one and two. OK, thank you. The other question is with the T interval. Yeah. And you, you had mentioned how you did not collect data on the weekend. Yeah. And, and you'd go from five I to I didn't eight. collect any data. but. <laughs> In, in your thought experiment right, yes, there. Yes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, you could get the same results if you just created a, a row of missing data. Yes, yes. For, if you uh, would do this yourself, right. then you would actually not need this statement here. Yeah, yeah. Okay. That's exactly yeah, the idea. Very good. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Yeah, I was going to follow up on the same line. So if the, then if you had a data column with a session date, M plus is able to surmise from the date, the no, interval? Or? No, no. So yeah, yeah. it has to, uh, it's, it's not a date variable. So it's session date, but it's actually the day, it's just day, a day, day. variable. Yeah. Okay, so so that definitely, and especially with ESM data, which I'm sh talking about later, where you have typically a variable that's day, and then a variable with time within the day, you would want to get these together somehow to represent, for instance, hours since the beginning of the study. And it's something, yeah, I mean, that's the most challenging part, I think, you know. It's, but I figured out how to do it in, in SPSS, so that was like, 
big hooray moment. But that's, I, you know, there's, in, that would be something that you have to do outside of N+. Yeah. One of the, this is kind of a, a general question, a more conceptual question, in that when we're dealing with uh, string data or data over time like this, um, there's an issue of whether sampling in the morning or the evening or the weekend has kind of unique variance attributed to it. Um, and I'm wondering, um, have you tried using this framework for, for doing some sort of generalizability studies to, to be able to systematically guide us about when to yeah. sample occasions? Yeah, so this could be, you could have a, another variable. So it's, it would be a time varying predictor, for instance, that indicates whether it's in the morning or in the afternoon or the evening or the day of the week. You could have dummy variables for this. And you could add them as predictors at level one to account for their effects to see if they have an effect. That would be one way. Of course, another one would be to look at cycles. Uh, that's definitely something that I want to do. But well, you, just to be one more level, you'd have to randomly assign those facets to people so you don't have any kind of selection bias in there. But it seems right. like a great yeah. framework for that. Yeah. Um, so in the, uh, in the variable command, is M plus automatically doing the within person centering? In the variable, oh, I I've, mean, when, no, you do, the, when you do the, when you do the yeah. lagged and the, the T interval and, and whatnot. So when it's creating the lagged, um, of course, is it automatically centering? So you make the argument and we're interpreting stuff as the random intercepts mm -hmm. as the, the person centered means. So is M plus automatically doing the, yeah. that centering? Because yeah. I don't see a centering. No, but it's just a two level there. part here. Yeah. It automatically makes it do it like this. OK. Yeah. All right. Um, and uh, on the, the input as well, um, if you uh, can use I add so what it's doing it's it's using for the centering of the predictor it's using latent centering so it's not using it's so it's different than which, when you would say center and then you know cluster mean because then it would use the observed mean and that gives the problem that um, then you would need an intercept here you know because these would be centered but this one would not be centered so then you would have an intercept here that represents the mean of this thing, but it would be a different inter or different mean than the one that was used to center this. And that's when you get Nichols bias. But because we are using latent centering and we're using the same centering for the variable and its lagged version, Nichols bias is gone. Sure. So in, like the diagram, the, the sort of yes. latent decomposition yeah. there is yeah. the way the model yeah. is being yeah. specified. Um, if you were to add a, a save data, um, can you get the save the actual new constructed data set with the, with the lagged variables and the missing data? To you. Uh, so um, to you uh, to actually get the uh, centered version, all you need is the uh, random intercept between portion of the variable, right? Yeah, but the the lag structure, so the multiple columns with y t t minus one. So save yeah, the observed. So save data will give you the observed lag structure. If you want the centered, you have to subtract sure. the. Um, between portion of the variable, which is uh, you know a, f uh, a random effect uh, that you can actually you have to request uh, you know the uh, save factor scores, and right. then you know those uh, between the portions will be imputed, and you can subtract that you know estimate. Sure. Okay. Thanks. Let's uh, let's move this forward because there was some other question on the same slide. Or are you fine? Okay. Okay. Maybe on this side then. That seems fair. Thanks. Um, I have two questions. The first is, what do I do if I want to do that in a three-level model? For instance, if I have a day effect in the middle, or if I have uh, situations nested in individuals, nested in classrooms. Um, but maybe we can postpone that, because the other one is more specific. Um, if I think about uh, time series networks, I 
would usually have only two variables, one for positive effect and one for negative, and then there's an arrow going from positive to negative, one yes. from negative yeah. to positive, yeah. Yeah. and then the two autocorrelations. Yeah. That would be the, the, the network for the dynamic part, so for yes. the within-person parts. Uh, that's definitely one network that you can represent. Another network is for the between-person parts, and as I said, I wouldn't interpret it as representing something about yeah. dynamics, it's just a way to represent a correlation matrix. I yeah. just wondered, yeah. how do I get those autocorrelations and basically, um, you know, regression coefficients for that two-node network that I have in mind from that output. So, yeah, so you have the, I would say, use the standardized parameters, legs parameters here, put them in a matrix and feed them to QGraph and then make sure that you indicate that this is a, a VAR model. Yeah, and that's how to do it. Yeah, yeah and the other question, so uh, I know that Theomir will talk a little bit tomorrow about a model in which was, the question is, is ESM data, should you think of this as two-level data, so time points within in individuals, or is it beeps within days mm -hmm. individuals, so a three-level model. So he has some solution for this in, in M+, but it's about treating the days actually in wide formats rather than long formats. So, so far the model is limited to two level. Mm -hmm. So extending it to classrooms is not possible yet. We have a question over here. Yeah. Again, uh, just a clarification on the centering part. So if you go to input code in 31, slide number 31. So in the between statement, I understand day PA and day NA are the latent mean, right? Yes. Now if I go to the within statement, Mm -hmm. Day PA on day PA ampersand one. Mm -hmm. So the day PA ampersand one is M plus automatically doing a mean a cluster uh, centering there, or yeah. it's the yeah. raw score of day PA at lag minus no. one? No. no, it really is. So for the between part, when we say day PA, it's the latent mean. It's this, yeah. this thing. So uh -huh. that's this thing. Yeah. For the within part, when we say day PA, it's this thing here. On. Day PA M percent one. That's this thing. So it is the the, but it's already the centered one. Yeah. So it's plus centered. It, yeah. This is the M percent one. Okay. It yeah. centers for yeah. that. Yeah. It uses so it uses the same mean to center this variable as this one because it's it's the same variable for one person. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So in the slides thirty five. P, P, N parameter with a estimate 0 0.03 and P, N, N, P parameter of estimate 0 0.03. Why do you think that parameter shows the positive estimate? Because I sorry, I don't Can the you correlation start? between the positive effect and negative effect this one. actually showed negative, mm -hmm. but the parameter of PPN and PMP okay, shows yeah. positive parameter. Yeah. Why do you think yeah, it's happening? Yeah, yeah. So yeah, that's <laughs> well spotted. <laughs> so this is the correlation between the innovations. So that's within the same day. So within the same day, the part that we cannot predict about positive effect is negatively related to the part we cannot predict for negative effect. Yeah. So that makes sense, I think. These are a little awkward, I agree. Um, so what we see is that the lagged, the cross-lagged relationships are positive, you know, going from, from, neg for, sorry, from positive effects to negative effect the next day is a positive relationship. Meaning if you were higher on positive effect yesterday, you are likely to have a higher score on negative effect today. But also the reverse. If you were lower on positive effect, yesterday, you are tempted to have lower negative effect. So it could be a sort of a regulation mechanism, you know. Um, so, and, and I mean, we've seen, I don't know what to expect here. I mean, I guess if I was completely, yeah, like just had to guess, I would expect negative relationships, but it turns out to be positive ones. And we see this sometimes also for dyadic data, where we look at husbands and wives. And you see relationships from, for instance, um, the husband, 
or yeah, like from the or from the wife to the husband. Like if the wife feels bad, the husband tends to feel better the next day. You know, it's like <laughs> I don't know. I mean, we have to see if this replicates, and you know, or, or like what are the alternative explanations for this? But I think the point is we don't know uh, very much about these dynamics, and also they they might depend on the interval between the observations. So uh, th this is another dimension that you have to add when you, when you think about uh, dynamics. Like the interval between observations also um, changes what the relationships will be. So. Okay, so one final question before uh, the coffee break. I think it's yours. Um, can you talk just a bit more about how this latent centering doesn't cause nickel bias? Um, <laughs> yes. I, um, I, actually, other people will be talking about it a lot more. So I think Tiumi will be talking about it tomorrow, and, and I'm definite that Martin, Martin will be talking about it. Yes? No? Yeah. 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 Tiumi will have a good technical session on that topic tomorrow, so okay. we'll, uh, we can save it for that. Hold on, the, the way it really solves the problem, for, first of all, we didn't actually pay it. That was not important. When we were working on this, we, you know, we just do maximum likelihood and we do our thing, right? We just make sure it estimates correctly. After that, when we started looking at what people have been doing in the past, we realized, oh, well, we solved this problem without knowing we solved it because people have <laughs> you know, been struggling with it for a while. Uh, but the way it actually uh, works in the estimation is that uh, it actually accounts for the fact that the predictor has uncertainty in it. Because what other people have been doing is, by trying to center it, they always actually make the predictor be fixed, an observed thing. Where in M+, plus, it actually allows for this the, the, to be some uncertainty in the predictor because it's a, an observed quantity minus, uh, minus the centering, which is latent. So there is some kind of a an uncertainty in the predictor that absorbs um, part of the, um, uh, it properly accounts for, you know, if you look from one period to another, you want to have this possibility of uncertainty in the predictor.